Thank you for joining us for this virtual event of the Paris Calls Principle 3 on Defending Electoral Processes. We're delighted today to launch the Compendium on Countering Election Interference, which is a collection of insights and best practices for safeguarding elections and democracy. Merci d'être parmi nous pour cet événement virtuel du principe 3 de l'Appel de Paris sur la défense des processus électoraux. Il me fait grand plaisir de lancer aujourd'hui le recueil sur la défense des processus électoraux, qui est un guide en sorte de ressources et de meilleures pratiques pour protéger les élections et la démocratie. We will begin today with brief remarks from each speaker and then transition to question and answer session. If you'd like to ask us a question, please submit it in the chat window on the right hand side of your screen and indicate to whom you'd like to direct the question. Nous débuterons avec quelques propos de la part de chacun des conférenciers, le tout suivi d'une session de questions et réponses. Si vous aimeriez poser une question à un des conférenciers, s'il vous plaît, utilisez la fenêtre de messagerie ou chat située à la droite de votre écran et s'il vous plaît, indiquez à qui vous dirigez votre question. Il me fait maintenant plaisir de vous présenter nos trois conférenciers. Tout d'abord, l'honorable Dominique Leblanc, président du Conseil privé de la Reine pour le Canada et ministre des Affaires intergouvernementales. Il sera suivi de Brad Smith, président de Microsoft, qui lui sera suivi de la Dr. Karen Donfried, présidente du German Marshall Fund des États-Unis. It is now my pleasure to introduce our three speakers. First up, the President of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, the Honorable Dominique Leblanc, followed by President of Microsoft, Brad Smith, followed by the President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, Dr. Karen Donfried. Minister, over to you. So uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Christine. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I'm four hours ahead. I'm on the east coast of Canada, so I'm four hours ahead of uh, Brad. Uh, but it's a privilege to be here, particularly with Brad uh, and Karen. Uh, and I thank you very, very much for including us in this uh, important milestone. A little more than a year ago, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. Around the world, borders closed and the skies and streets emptied. In Canada, we went into our first lockdown and life became virtual. Our government shifted to online debates and committee meetings in Canada's House of Commons. Since then, we have been living through all of us unprecedented times, both personally and professionally. One of the fascinating lessons has been observing how people use technology and the internet to strengthen and facilitate democracy. The fact that this pandemic has forced us to spend more of our lives online than ever before has been something new. There have been positives. Technology has enabled people to stay connected, to check in with each other, and to mobilize support for good causes. We have also seen the opposite. Malicious actors using technology to sow division, discord and mistrust, exposing our democracy to both cyber threats and campaigns of disinformation. Take COVID-19, fake news, disinformation and conspiracy theories about the virus have literally gone viral. And while there is no one way to solve disinformation or cyber security challenges, especially during a pandemic, I think we all have the obligation to try because we know they can have significant consequences on people's lives. We also know they can influence public opinion and behavior and potentially also influence democratic elections. L'internet et les plateformes de médias sociaux doivent être un foyer pour la liberté d'expression. C'est là une caractéristique cruciale de toute démocratie. Cependant, Je crois que les Canadiens s'attendent à voir leur gouvernement collaborer avec des partenaires de la société civile et du secteur privé pour veiller à ce que l'Internet demeure un outil démocratique efficace, un outil résilient face aux menaces et un lien de communication sécuritaire et d'échange d'informations fiable. C'est ce que nous avons fait ici. Last May, the Government of Canada Microsoft and the Alliance for Securing Democracy joined forces 
to co-champion principle three of the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace to prevent election interference through malicious cyber activities before problems arise. Over the past few months, we have been together leading a series of virtual workshops on everything from the technological infrastructure of election systems to citizen resilience in the face of disinformation. A broad range of experts and practitioners from Canada and around the world attended and participated. Multi-stakeholder insights, a compendium on countering election interference is the cul culmination of that important work. It captures key observations, ideas, and good practices for defending electoral processes that were shared by so many of the different uh, stakeholders. I want to thank everyone who contributed to this important compendium. In particular, obviously, we want to recognize the Alliance for Securing Democracy. The Alliance is a leader in undertaking research and analyses to help protect democracies around the world. And of course, Microsoft, led by Brad Smith. Microsoft was one of the earliest global corporations to set up, to step up, and to commit to building a cyberspace that reflects our shared democratic values. And I want to salute its president, Brad Smith, personally, and his colleagues at Microsoft for their outstanding work. They've become a global example of best practices. As the compendium illustrates, election interference is a common threat that democracies face. And because everyone is being targeted, we have to work together across political parties, across governments with civil society and industry, obviously, and across different parts of our democratic ecosystems. We need to have creative solutions to increase our collective resilience. La force des partenariats. C'est le fait que chacun ait sa propre perspective, sa propre expérience et sa propre compréhension des choses. Le recueil nous démontre que nous pouvons travailler tous ensemble, apprendre les uns des autres et adapter collectivement. Il confirme aussi que nous avons des visées communes. Nous espérons que ce recueil de pratiques exemplaires sera une ressource utile pour ceux et celles qui voudront protéger des élections et la démocratie. Our work is really never done. Malicious actors who use technology to threaten democracies are always adapting, and so must we. The compendium represents a very important step forward. We have gained new insights from one another and laid the basis for cooperation with so many other partners from civil society, the private sector, and obviously democratic governments as well. In the last year, we, if the last year has taught us anything, it's that we're stronger and more resilient when we learn from each other, listen to each other, and work together. And I thank all of you for your participation in this very important exercise. So with that, I thank you. And now I think, Christine, we turn it over to the president of Microsoft, to Brad Smith. Merci beaucoup. Uh, well, well, thank you. Um, I I want to say most importantly, I, I, you know, just how grateful I am and all of us at Microsoft are for the work that the Canadian government has led, that the you know, German Marshall Fund and the Alliance for Securing Democracy have advanced, and I'm sure for the work that a lot of the individuals who are watching this right now have put into this. Um, I do think that this is a key milestone, and it's really worth reflecting on just its importance. Um, I'd start with the birth of the Paris call itself two and a half years ago in Paris. Um, I would say Prime Minister Trudeau and the Canadian government were there at the beginning. And no government has done more than the Canadian government to advance the protection of democratic elections during the past two and a half years. And it is just, I think, an extraordinary set of steps for which all the world's democracies should be grateful. Uh, you know, the, the birth of the Paris call reflected what the French government championed in having the Paris Peace Forum in November of 2018. Yeah, and that was the centennial of the armistice 
that ended World War I, a war that was supposed to end all wars and obviously did not. And you know, the ideas that came together to give birth to the Paris call really reflected what President Macron had championed. Yeah, you know, the sense that we needed to continually reinvest and renew the world's democracies, that this required multilateral diplomacy. And in the 21st century, it really requires multi-stakeholder efforts. And this work that has resulted in this compendium, I think in so many ways is the best reflection of all of that. Um, I'm so pleased that the Paris call has just not only grown, in so many ways it's exploded in all the best senses of that word. You know, with more than 1,100 signatories, with 75 governments, you know, with NGOs and businesses and others from all around the world. But it isn't just a declaration, which is where it began. You know, it really has become a blueprint for action. And this compendium reflects that. Uh, I'm particularly proud in the work that went into this because I think this principle three, the protection of elections, in so many ways is one of the most important aspects of the Paris call. Uh, when the Paris call was coming together, we all looked at it and a lot of it strengthens norms that had already been embraced around the world. But this principle three, the protection of elections, was not something that had been as well established in the past, frankly, because I think people took for granted that it was easier to protect. And then suddenly we found that technology had put the protection of elections at risk. So it really required a sense of priority and focus. And I know we'll get into more of the details in the Q&A, but I would just say, when I had the chance to read this compendium, I just was so pleased and impressed. I mean, the analytical framework that people brought to bear, you know, starting with the need for multi-stakeholder communication, you know, the focus on defining the problem, what is election interference that is out of bounds, learning from the last year in terms of COVID-19, because there are lasting less lessons about how to make voting easy and secure, and then this bringing to bear of practical solutions for practical problems, how we secure the infrastructure, how we combat disinformation quickly and effectively. There is just a wealth of knowledge reflected in what is being published. And it is knowledge that I do believe will protect all the world's democracies in fundamentally new ways. So thank you to the Canadian government. Thank you to the Alliance. Thank you to everyone who's involved. Back to you all. Okay. Karen, is it, do I pass the baton? Karen? I think I think you, I'm, you. I'm grabbing the baton from you. Um, thank, you. Th thank you so much, Minister LeBlanc. Thank you so much, Brad. What a pleasure to be on this virtual stage with the two of you as we help launch this compendium on countering election interference. This issue is central to the mission of the German Marshall Fund. Supporting democracy in multilateral formats has been part of GMF's core activities for decades. Since 2017, when the Alliance for Securing Democracy was launched at GMF, we've been looking at election interference with greater focus. For those of you who are not familiar with the Alliance for Securing Democracy, AKA ASD, it is a nonpartisan initiative housed at GMF that develops comprehensive strategies to deter, defend against, and raise the costs on autocratic efforts to undermine and interfere in our democratic institutions. And I do want to give a shout out to my colleagues in ASD for the incredible work they've been doing in recent years. The challenges democracies face are enormous and they have only grown over the last year. Minister LeBlanc, you spoke about the importance of these issues in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, where we're living our lives connected digitally, but physically separate. In the United States, the threat of election interference took on new meaning in light of the 2020 election. I'm sitting here in Washington, DC, 
And during the campaign and the months leading to President Biden's inauguration, the question of election integrity rose to previously unseen prominence. For those of us in D.C., it felt personal. And the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th was particularly shocking. It makes the work being done around principle three more important than ever. ASD recently published an assessment of the 2020 elections and found that the threat landscape is growing more dynamic. In 2020, Russia and Iran took active steps to influence US voters engaging in information operations at times augmented by cyber attacks to denigrate candidates, sow chaos and division, and reduce trust in democratic institutions. We also saw new players, including Cuba, Venezuela, and other non-state actors also take steps to influence voters and attack election infrastructure. But good practices emerged as well. Media, civil society, government actors like the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency the FBI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and private sector actors like Microsoft, Google, and Cloudflare played leading roles in communicating with citizens, and they gave significant attention to countering the threat of foreign interference in the 2020 U.S. election. A major takeaway from ASD's 2020 election assessment was on the importance of civil society for bringing governments, citizens, and the private sector together. But giving civil society this outsized role alone may not be sustainable, which is where this Paris call community comes in. For efforts to counter interference to be sustainable, all sectors need to come together. No one actor, whether that's GMF, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's the government of Canada, can tackle this challenge on its own. The problem of foreign interference crosses borders, crosses sectors. No one has full visibility, nor the full basket of tools required to counter efforts by authoritarian states or non-state actors who are seeking to disrupt electoral and democratic processes. The compendium we're launching today shows the wealth of knowledge that comes from all of us working together. Over the past year, the Government of Canada, Microsoft, and ASD organized a series of workshops with scores of experts from across government, civil society, and the private sector in North America, Europe, and the Pacific to provide practical solutions for us to share. I want to draw three key lessons from that compendium. First, communication within government, but also between sectors, is essential for understanding and countering the threat of interference. These bridges between disparate realms need to be built in advance of crisis so that government and private sector actors and civil society know who to contact when those problems emerge. Knowing whom to call and having a plan for how to communicate with citizens is a critical baseline for everyone working on these issues, regardless of sector or country. The second point I wanna highlight is that the COVID-19 pandemic has made conducting elections more challenging than before. Providing safer options for citizens to vote means voting differently than before, including earlier, in advance of elections, by mail, and maybe sometimes online. It is critical for us to think through and mitigate against interference risks during the pandemic. <clears throat> Third and finally, election infrastructure protection goes beyond what happens on election day. Critical steps need to be taken before, during, and after election day to ensure that election systems are protected. Even after the election, certain vulnerabilities remain. Attention needs to be paid to election management systems, official websites, and to auditing processes. When you read the compendium, you'll find lessons learned and many other examples of good practices. 
from Canada, from Microsoft, from places like Finland as well. So I really would encourage all of you to download this compendium and give it a read. ASD is gonna to continue to focus very strongly on election integrity. We're kicking off a project about the upcoming election in Germany and hope you'll follow the work we're doing there as well. But for now, all I can say is there is still lots of work for all of us to do. And I look so forward to keeping the community that was fostered through this compendium focused on this important topic. Thanks so much. Merci beaucoup, Karen. Thank you so much, Karen. We're now gonna move on to Q&A. Just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for our speakers, please do put them in the chat window. Si vous avez des questions pour nos conférenciers, s'il vous plaît, les mettre dans la boîte de messagerie. Et nous allons commencer avec une première question pour les trois panélistes. Puis on va peut-être commencer avec vous, Monsieur le ministre. Euh, quel rôle jouent les efforts collaboratifs comme celui-ci entre le gouvernement du Canada, le German Marshall Fund et Microsoft dans la lutte contre l'ingérence électorale? So we're going to start with the first question for each of the three of you, and I'll get Minister Leblanc to start. But what role do cooperative efforts like these among Microsoft, the German Marshall Fund and the government of Canada play to help counter election interference? Minister? Well, thank you, uh, Christine. And it, it's a good question because I think it's it's the very essence of why uh, we're here uh, on this virtual platform today, why we uh, launched the collaborative effort uh, some 11 months ago. Uh, I think uh, Karen said it very well, as did Brad, governments alone, the private sector alone, uh, civil society alone is not able to Uh, both strengthen democratic values uh, and democratic uh, infrastructure that's important for the, the safe and, and free conduct of, uh, of elections. It has to be done collaboratively. And if governments are doing it without the benefit of partnerships with civil society, and if some of the great global digital platforms like Microsoft aren't partners and leaders as they have been in this area, Uh, then we're all going to come up short. So uh, politics is a, is a rough and tumble sport. I've been lucky enough to be elected for 20 years uh, in Canada's House of Commons. Uh, elections are necessarily uh, uh, contact events, um, but people expect to have a free and open discourse uh, that's based on reliable information and not be manipulated by foreign state actors, by disinformation, have as... I think uh, Karen uh, mentioned hacking of critical election infrastructure. So much of elections now are conducted on virtual platforms. It sort of behooves all of us to share best practices and to collaborate. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to get the level of resiliency we need. And people will, the worst outcome would be people will, will lose faith in democratic institutions. I don't think uh, any of us would want to see something as serious as that. I'll just maybe jump in and, and build on what both of you have said. And, and Karen, uh, I agree. You put it really nicely, I thought, when you summarized uh, some of the principal lessons in the compendium. I'd offer two observations. One is we need multi-stakeholder action, as Minister LeBlanc just remarked, um, because we see different parts of the problem. And the only way to understand the problem as it unfolds is to connect the dots between all of the different pieces. Uh, at a company like Microsoft, we have a threat intelligence center. We're able to monitor all of the signals that are coming into our data centers. And we are part of the early warning system, if you will, uh, that's able to detect when th there are new efforts that are launched from, say, a foreign government to interfere with the electoral process. And obviously, intelligence agencies and others see information as well but you cannot possibly put the complete picture together unless there is better sharing, frankly, in a way that wasn't required before the internet was created and you had tech companies playing this type of role. Second, in a similar way, I don't think you can be effective in responding to these kinds of threats unless you bring together people in say civil society and key NGOs, key businesses, typically tech companies, and key governments. And even within governments, 
as the compendium really highlights, different parts of governments are having to work together in new ways. You have the part of a government that is responsible for elections, and then you have an intelligence agency, and they're needing to collaborate in ways that were just really not part of the landscape two or three decades ago. So you know, not only do we advance you know, this collaboration between different sectors of our societies, in doing so, we even, I think, actually help foster better communication, say, within the tech sector or within individual governments when we all come together in this way. I can just put some what both of you said. I think this point that each of us brings a different lens to this issue of election integrity is critical. And, you know, when folks read the compendium, I was struck by the breadth of issues looked at. There are some very specific issues around election integrity and what state or local election officials need to do and very thoughtful uh, steps outlined in the report. There are also questions about how do we build resilience of our citizens? What do we do about misinformation and disinformation and fact checking? Lots of interesting suggestions there. There was also a basket of issues around distinguishing between foreign interference and foreign influence. How do we distinguish between those two things? And, and what is it that we're not happy to see? And what is it that is acceptable? So I think the breadth of issues that we need to consider when we talk about election integrity mean that we need to bring this community together and benefit from those different sets of experiences to make sure that we keep future elections as safe as possible. Excellent. Merci à tous pour vos réponses. Those were great answers. On to our next question from Kat Tunney at CBC. This one's for you, Minister. How would you rate the risk level for foreign election interference heading into the next Canadian election? Higher than in 2019, same, less? Donc, Monsieur le ministre, question pour vous de Kat Tunney de CBC. Comment évalueriez-vous le niveau de risque d'ingérence électorale étrangère pour la prochaine élection canadienne, donc un risque plus élevé qu'en 2019, moins pareil, Monsieur le ministre? Uh, so, thank you for the question. Um, obviously, I think globally, the number uh, of, of attempts to uh, influence elections in, in a malicious way, uh, the use of disinformation, the use of, of cyber threats is increasing globally. So, I don't think Canada... Uh, should naively think we're immune to that. I think we can take note of the Canadian Security Establishment uh, annual report, which said that in 2020, the threat to democratic institutions uh, and free and fair elections um, was, was not very high. Uh, I think a lot of that uh, was because there's a much greater level of citizen awareness, citizen resiliency, um, I think Karen said it well, the sharing of reliable information is obviously what empowers citizens uh, to make the democratic choices that, that they must make. Um, so uh, my own view, and obviously our government has decided to leave in place uh, the elements that were, were stood up before the 2019 general election. So uh, a year and a half, two years ago, um, whether it's the critical election incident protocol, whether it's uh, briefings for political parties, whether it's um, ensuring uh, digital uh, citizen resiliency, uh, working directly with civil society to enhance their efforts to support uh, citizen resiliency. All of those measures we're going to continue to support because we think that the best way to keep the threat uh, at a manageable level uh, is to maintain all of the elements that are necessary to safeguard democracy. And that's why the compendium today and just the comments uh, from Brad and Karen, for example, um, are what countries, I would argue, democratic countries, certainly like, like Canada, uh, should take into consideration as we prepare for uh, future general elections. So uh, the threat environment can evolve very rapidly. COVID-19, I think, has uh, probably increased uh, globally the use of disinformation uh, campaigns. So I think it's naive to think that our electoral context is necessarily going to be insulated from those. But maybe maybe my colleagues, maybe 
Brad or, or Karen want to add something in, in, a, in a global context or with respect to the United States? I would just say two things. One is uh, it, it, we continue collaboratively to get stronger, but so do the adversaries that we're having to be prepared to address. So yeah, you, you take both of those things and I'd say, yeah, 2021 requires about as much vigilance as 2019 and 2020, and both of those years required quite a bit. And you know, we just can never put ourselves in a position where we become sanguine and think that we have the upper hand, because I think the day we do is probably the day where we'll be surprised or, or blindsided. And, and second, I'd, I'd go back to something that Karen said, and you know, this is I, you know, the, the two of us living in the United States perhaps feel this more strongly, but I know it's not unique uh, to the views of Americans in the United States. Um, you know, January 6th in so many ways was, you know, one of the worst days in the history of American democracy. Maybe it was one of the worst days in the history of democracy from a global perspective, because you literally had the elected representatives of the people doing the work to count the votes cast by the people subject to a physical assault on the process and even their safety. And you know, it was an event that followed two months of you know, what I think many people rightly have concluded was a sustained effort to not just persuade, but in fact, mislead people about what had happened in the election. Uh, and I think that too is an event that needs to not just remind us, but you know, frankly, inspire us uh, to protect democracy every day. Um, you can't do it only on the days when the votes are counted. You've got to do it every day in every year. I just would love to foot stomp the point you both made, which is that we can't be sanguine about the integrity of our elections. I think this is an issue that is going to be with us for a long time to come. And what's so challenging is that you know, one could say, well, what's really the impact of some of this disinformation or misinformation? And it's not about one attempt here or an individual piece of disinformation there. That has a small impact, but the combined effect of foreign adversaries seeking to undermine our elections can be very significant. It's also incredibly challenging, if not impossible, to determine with confidence that foreign intervention swayed the result of an election. Or it's hard to prove that it was responsible for greater polarization in our societies. But we know that those outcomes are possible. And we know that if we don't work on building up our resilience to those efforts by foreign actors, then we are very likely to see a profound impact on our elections through those efforts. So I think this need for us to remain vigilant and work together on this is a critical formula going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question up from Andres Petersons. Uh, this one's for you, Karen. What are the biggest successes and biggest failures since 2017 encountering election interference from your perspective. Donc, selon vous, Karen, uh, quels sont les succès et les échecs les plus grands depuis 2017 en matière de lutte contre l'ingérence électorale? Karen? Thanks so much. Uh, this follows so nicely from my last comment, which is, of course, it's hard to know exactly to what extent U.S. elections have been affected by that foreign interference. The measuring of that impact is just devilishly hard to uh, sort out. But I think we have seen clear efforts by election officials to build resilience in the system. So in the run-up to our most recent election last November, November of 2020, let me just highlight three resiliency measures that officials put into place. One, we're now much smarter about backing up registration databases. Secondly, we are now making sure that our local election officials are, have printed paper poll book backups in every polling place. And thirdly, 
we're keeping plenty of provisional voting materials on hand at each polling place. So we've tried to learn some lessons from the past and make sure that in 2020, we were ready for those particular challenges. But I would encourage the uh, person who asked the question to dive into that compendium because there we list an additional, I mean, there are at least an additional six measures that we are encouraging folks to take on. And I'm tempted to read them, but I won't. Uh, but I just want you to know that there's a richness in the, this compendium and a specificity of recommendations that I think will be very helpful to polling officials. Thanks, Christine. Great, thank you. On to our next question from Senator Donna Dasko. Uh, and this one will be to you, Brad. Which countries, in your view, merit the most attention now for action to preserve fair elections? Donc, Brad, quel pays, selon vous, mérite le plus d'attention afin d'agir pour protéger les élections justes et ouvertes de la part uh, de Sénateur Dasko? Over to you, Brad. Well, I'd offer two thoughts. I mean, one is I think one always needs to sort of shift on an ongoing basis uh, to focus on the countries that are likely to have national elections next. Um, because you know, what we see in terms of the actions by uh, you know, the principal foreign adversaries who tend to you know, pursue this kind of interference operation uh, is they follow the elections around the world. Um, so, you know, there are some countries like Canada that may have an election, but obviously isn't obliged to. There's other countries where we know exactly, you know, every four years in the United States, we know exactly when the next national election uh, will, will, will be for our executive branch and the like. Um, but for, you know, one of the things we do is, you know, it's 2021 and we're focused on especially deep work in partnership uh, with the countries that are uh, on the list for the next round of elections. Yeah, you know, the second thing I would say is, um, I think one of the lessons of uh, the last couple of years uh, is that we have to worry both about foreign interference, um, but then the domestic weaknesses that can make that foreign interference more impactful and an even more serious threat. And so we have to think about those countries as well. Um, Oftentimes, these are countries where the electorate itself is very diverse. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's one of the uh, challenges we're grappling with, say, in the United States. I think that the strengthening of uh, yeah, resilience in the United States needs to be a particular priority. Um, but there are many great democracies where the electorate is very diverse. I think about the world's largest democracy, India, for example, and the importance of the work that is uh, taking place there. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, I'd probably go back to where uh, Karen was earlier. And, you know, there's no country where we can afford to be sanguine. So we, we prioritize different countries uh, at different moments in time. But if you look at the work that we're doing through our account guard system, for example, to protect politicians and think tanks and the like, it really is a global effort. It needs to be that. Great, thank you, Brad. And we are now entering our last question. C'est la dernière question. Uh, so for all those that didn't get a chance to be responded to, uh, we will take them back after though. So rest assured, we will do our best to uh, get you some answers. Donc la dernière question de la part de Christopher Nardi. Avez-vous pris connaissance de nouvelles menaces émergentes, moins présentes ou moins importantes en 2019, mais qui sont maintenant inquiétantes à l'approche d'une élection potentielle 2021? Donc, c'est pour euh, Monsieur le ministre et Brad. So, uh, final question to both Brad and the minister. Have you noticed, uh, or have you noted, apologies, any new emerging threats that may not have been as important in 2019, but that are now of concern or of note going into a potential 2021 election from Christopher Nardi? All right, Christine, I'll just offer a few comments and then Brad can obviously uh, add his insights. Uh, as I said, our, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, CSIS, released a report a few days ago uh, which confirmed, I think, what all of us believe to be the case, that the threat levels and the threat dynamics are generally increasing. So an election, if there is ultimately an election in Canada this year or next year, we don't have the luxury of having the certainty that our American friends do. 
uh, as to when we'll have a national election. But in the next general election in Canada, I think we should just assume that the threat environment and the threat context has increased since our last election uh, in the fall of, of 2019, almost two years ago. Uh, COVID, as we've said uh, during the, this conversation, uh, has uh, given, I think, energy to different uh, state actors and non-state actors who want to disrupt uh, and sow discord and divide societies or uh, agitate uh, racism and hatred. Uh, we've seen very ugly examples of that around the world. So uh, we shouldn't assume that those practices will necessarily go away during an electoral cycle where many of these views become sharper and where people sort of have a bigger megaphone uh, as an election is rolling. Um, and therefore, the, the temptation from these malevolent actors, uh, I think, will increase. So um, I'm not an expert in the, in the global uh, intelligence and security community at all. But the briefings that we've had and certainly what Canadian security agencies have made public and obviously informed by the work that they have with their Five Eyes partners with uh, the United Kingdom and the United States and Australia and New Zealand um, indicates that the threat environment is increasing. So as Karen so correctly said and Brad, it behooves all of us to continue this collaboration uh, and to do what we can to build the necessary citizen resilience. I would say there's two aspects of the threat landscape that are continuing to change and are really continuing to become even more serious and severe. Uh, you know, one is sort of what I would call very precisely targeted, incredibly sophisticated and well-resourced engineering efforts to penetrate specific targets of interest. Uh, that's what we saw, for example, in the so-called Solarigate uh, uh, attack that started with uh, the, the malware implanted uh, into an update for SolarWinds. And yeah, I think we just have to work on the assumption that if one of these major governments wants to put enormous resources to penetrate a specific agency account, um, you know, it's a very formidable threat. That's narrow, specific, and deep, and it can be targeted against election infrastructure. The second change in the threat landscape that is also concerning is a, an attack about breadth rather than specifics. And namely, it's the aggregation of increasingly large data sets of people in democratic societies, and then the potential use of machine learning to put that to work for broader based disinformation campaigns that would at one level be focused on social media platforms, but in the world today may also seek to reach people through their email accounts or even their mobile numbers with text messages. So we simultaneously need to defend against more targeted attacks and broader disinformation campaigns. And I would just say the interesting thing, and to me the encouraging thing, is if you go back to the various workshops that took place and the specific chapters in this compendium, the recipe for success is there. You know, starting with the multi-stakeholder communication, I think the work that is in the compendium to really define electoral interference you know, it's opaque, it's deceptive, it's intended to interfere. I think all of that needs to be sort of elevated and advanced by the NGO community and the world's democracies. And then if you look at the various other parts of the compendium, it really is a very pragmatic blueprint about how to make voting easy but secure, how to protect the various pieces of the electoral infrastructure, how to respond quickly, really in real time, to these kinds of disinformation campaigns. So even though the threats are continuing to change, uh, I really think that we're on the right path in how to defend against them. Karen, any final thoughts on addressing some of these emerging threats? I think it underscores the importance of all of us coming together, private sector, government, civil society, so that we can adequately 
build the resilience we need in our societies against these threats. I think, you know, Brad just made clear that this threat is only becoming more complicated for us to manage. So I would I, I would put up the cooperation among these sectors. Thanks. Thanks very much, Karen. Et c'est tout le temps que nous avons. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre, Karen et Brad, pour cette discussion importante. Et merci à tous ceux et à celles qui se sont joints à nous aujourd'hui. On vous invite donc à lire le recueil, maintenant disponible en ligne. Le lien se retrouve dans le chat. Et ceci met fin à notre événement. Merci. That is unfortunately all the time we have today. So thank you very much, Minister Leblanc, Karen and Brad, for this important discussion. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in. We now invite you to consult the compendium. Please do. The link can be found in the chat. This now concludes our event. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, you, Christine, and thanks to everybody for the great work. Merci beaucoup. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for the cooperation very much. Bye-bye.